Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Brian Elaine, and I produce the Writing for Your Life conferences. Thank you for joining us at this very first Writing for Your Life online writers conference. Our hashtag is pound writing for your life if you'd like to use it on social media. Our session today features Christopher Farabee, who's an attorney and literary agent serving as counsel for content creators of all stripes, from individuals to large organizations. He combines years of literary agency representation with legal advice and career counseling, bringing a holistic approach to publishing, intellectual property licensing, and distribution. He has represented several New York Times bestsellers and winners of various Religion Newswriter Association awards and a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative, investigative journalist. Also, Chris served as one of our featured speakers at the recent Frederick Beekner Writers Workshop at Princeton Seminary. So today during the session, we will take questions through the chat box, and I will ask Chris some of those questions, um, particularly after his presentation is completed. So Chris, thanks very much for joining us today. Well, Brian, thanks for the introduction, and thank you all um, for being here for this presentation. I want to talk to you today about how to go about preparing a compelling nonfiction book proposal. And I would tell you from experience uh, about 15 years worth now, that for most first time authors that are trying to find an agent or find a publisher, this is a woefully neglected area. Uh, you need to know on the outset that if you want to find an agent or you want to find a publisher, you have to have a good proposal. I get approached all the time by people who want to pitch me an idea or send me a complete manuscript and haven't done the hard work of actually pulling together a proposal. and Nine out of 10 times, you're just not going to get anywhere uh, with either a, a potential editor or publisher or an agent. So the point of this is to really put you ahead of the game, for you to understand the importance of a proposal, even if you're just starting out, and walk you through the components of a proposal, the kinds of things that uh, you want to be thinking about as you pull that together. So let's dive right in. The first page of your proposal is going to give your project's title and subtitle. Now, that sounds obvious, uh, but I will tell you that um, a lot of people don't really know how to think about the title and subtitle. Sometimes you're going to have a very artsy or creative title that doesn't really in any way communicate what your book is about, or um, some people will just leave the title off altogether, figure someone else does that. But the title, and the subtitle is actually the lens through which your editor or potential agent is going to read your project. It's, it, in essence, should be communicating both a promise and a premise for what your book is about. And that is going to then inform how they read the rest of your proposal. So it's really, really important that you have a very clearly stated title and a very clearly stated subtitle. And again, you're talking about uh, both the promise of your book, what is the big idea that you're hoping to communicate, um, and the premise. And so let me show you just a couple of examples. As I walk through these sections today, uh, I want to flip back and forth between a couple of proposals, one for a project that was published years ago and one for a project from one of the other uh, Ready for Your Life presenters who's currently working on a book, and this book has not been published yet, so you're going to get to see kind of what we use to actually pitch a publisher um, on this project. But I think it will help you to see uh, what this looks like in real life as opposed to just me talking about it. So let's see here. So this is Jonathan Merritt. This is his title page, Learning to Speak God from Scratch. And that is, in essence, the promise that he's making, that he's going he's gonna to revisit um, some of our religious language and kind of uncover some of the meaning. And as we go further into this proposal, you'll see how he builds off of that idea. Uh, but what I want you to see here is just a title that is very clear, very direct, um, and easy to follow. And this is a project called Veneer living deeply in a surface society. The book was actually published under that title. I would tell you that Veneer um, really isn't my favorite title. Uh, it's not quite as clear as I would like it to be, but living deeply in a surface society 
um, is incredibly clear. And for a lot of people, it really speaks to the sense we have that, you know, we're all going a mile wide and an inch deep and that we're more concerned about appearance. And so that subtitle in this case is really helping to um, illuminate what is meant by the idea of veneer. And so in this case, um, I think it worked on this proposal. And again, this, this book was published uh, about six years ago. Now the sex, next section that you're gonna walk into is the overview of your book. And there's, there's really four things you need to cover here. The first thing is gonna be a hook. If you go and look for sample proposals or look for, for people who have written about how to prepare a proposal, they won't always include this, but I like to include it. I think it's, it, it really forces you to put together basically a 10 second elevator pitch. Can you sum up the big idea of your book in one line? That's, and that's your hook. Uh, sometimes this is easier in fiction. Um, imagine a hook that says the, this story is like the Titanic meets the zombie apocalypse. It, it's gonna create for you immediate imagery. You can sort of see the zombies running around the Titanic ship chasing uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, in nonfiction, it's sometimes a little bit harder um, to come up with something like that. But I would really encourage you to put the time in to try to, to come up with a one sentence hook um, that really encapsulates the big idea. And then the next um, part of this overview is gonna basically be, again, your premise, but now you've got two to three sentences to lay that out. And this is where you're, you're making a statement of the need your book is addressing and then your proposed solution. This is closer to like a 30 second elevator pitch. Um, again, you're communicating the bigger idea, but you're doing it in a little more detail. Um, then you're going to have a longer description, and this is going to be about three to four paragraphs. And this is where you really get to provide a little more of the narrative arc of your story um, or of your book and what it is that you're trying to get the reader to understand. Where, where are you assuming that your reader is starting? And by the end of your book, where do you want them to be? And over the course of about three to four paragraphs, that's what you're going to describe. And again, hopefully you're seeing this is sort of building on each other. You start with a couple of words in your title, and by now you're up to three to four paragraphs really walking through um, what your book is about. And then once you get past that longer description, you're gonna move into what's called a unique selling proposition. And this is, um, there's different ways to do this. The way that I like to do this best is in an if-then format. And so what this section basically looks like or what you would be saying is, if the target consumer reads my book, then something. They will be informed about an important topic. They will be transformed by the message that you bring. Um, you, and I'll demonstrate for you in a moment kind of what this looks like, but it's you basically, you're gonna walk through about three or four if-then statements. And then once you've done that, you're gonna say, because the book will, and then you're gonna have another three to four bullet points. And you're gonna list either the relevant information that you're going to be communicating, or you're going to be, you're going to list the bullet points of the actual inspiration that you're going to be providing. You're, it, it, what is it that you're going to give the reader in this book over the next, you know, over the, what is, what are the three or four bullet points you're going to give your reader in this book that is going to help them have the takeaway you want them to have? And then finally, you're going to say the book will not. And this is where you get to demonstrate that you actually understand who your target reader is and what it is that they need and what it is that they don't need. So for example, you may wanna write a book on a pretty heady theological concept, but your target consumer is somebody who doesn't have a seminary education or even a college education. So it's really important for you to, to be able to take what might be a little more of a heady topic and bring it down to more common language and, a, and an easier to understand presentation style. And so you might say the book will not be academic in nature. Um, if you're trying to reach a non-church audience with a gospel message, then you might say this book will not include lots of Christian insider lingo. You're going you're gonna to try to present this con um, the content that you have in a more, in a more 
easy to digest style for somebody who maybe didn't grow up in the church or doesn't really know a lot of the language that you might have been steeped in in your upbringing. And so you're, if the target consumer reads this book, they will, three or four bullet points, because the book will, three or four bullet points, and then the book will not. And you again, you would have two or three bullet points. So let's take a look at how this plays out in an actual proposal. All right, so this is Jonathan's proposal. Um, and this is we're basically the overview. So remember, we're talking about a hook, talking about a premise, we're talking about a longer description, and then we're talking about that unique selling proposition. So learning is begot from scratch was Jonathan's title. And then his hook is discover a faith worth talking about. And then his two sentence premise, the language we use to talk about God has become hollowed of meaning, littered with landmines, simplistic and stale. We need to become fluent in a fresh vocabulary of faith. And there you have a very clear in the first sentence of that premise, he's describing what he sees as the problem. In the second sentence, he's describing what he sees as the solution that he's going to provide. Now, one thing I want to point out to you too, you might notice that Jonathan's proposal as we walk through it is very highly designed. Uh, the veneer proposal um, is not as designed. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later at the end. I don't want you to focus on that at the moment, but just really the content that we're walking through as we go through these proposals. And then here you have Jonathan's overview where he's got about six paragraphs walking you through um, the story that he's gonna tell, starting with um, his move to New York City uh, his realization that the language that he grew up steeped in in the South um, didn't communicate with a lot of his new friends in the city and that he had to he had to really fight to uncover how to communicate what he believed about God to a new audience and that things that he would say and words that he would use while he had an assumed understanding or definition of those, his audience didn't share those. And so what, that's basically what drove him into this book. And through over the course of that interview, he's walking through, again, where, where this genesis of this idea came from, where he wants to take the reader. Now, this is the veneer proposal. They've laid it out a little bit differently, but this first sentence is basically their hook. The world has a love affair with itself. And I think for a lot of folks, that sentence resonates. Um, when you read that first sentence, it makes you want to read a little bit more. And then the next paragraph is basically their premise. More than anything, even TV, we love ourselves. We think of ourselves as many C-list celebrities, little Tony Danz is armed with Facebook, Twitter, and our personal blogs to broadcast how fabulous you two we are. Today, it seems everyone is entitled to his or her 15 minutes of fame. And then they go on with the overview over the course of several paragraphs to describe what it is that they see as the problem, and then what it is that they want to impart to the reader to help them transform the way they think about their interaction online, about the way they think about their interaction with friends and family, and ultimately calling the reader and trying to inspire the reader to live a more deep life and to not feel the need to be brought into um, comparison with what they see on social media. And again, you're going to see this laid out a little bit differently um, than Jonathan's proposal. And then we get down here to the unique selling point. Now, they have approached this differently than Jonathan did. And I actually, again, I don't prefer this approach. They're, they're, they're talking about the unique selling point in terms of these ideas that this book is timely, um, that it is fresh, that it's historical, that it's stirring, that it's empowering. Um, it's fine to go about it that way. I just, I think that it, it actually creates an opportunity for you to be a little too wordy. Um, it doesn't force you to really drill down into the big ideas that you're wanting to cover. Uh, and so to give you an example of more of that if then style, this is Jonathan's proposal talking about his unique selling proposition. If the target audience reads learning to speak God from sketch, they will be inspired to incorporate God talked into their every day. 
acquire new words to speak of their relationship, et cetera. And he's got five bullet points here of what the reader will do. And then he's got, because the book will, challenge prevailing understandings of God, faith, church, and life, provide numerous and succinct reflections on common spiritual words, et cetera. And again, he's got a few bullet points of what the book will do. And then he's got what the book will not do. And we'll talk in a minute about audience and why this is important. But for Jonathan's audience, it was important for him to be able to state that he's not coming at this with an intent to be critical of church or Christianity in any way. And he's not going to be preachy. And he doesn't want to give the impression that he's going to come at this in an overly serious manner. Um, because that's not Jonathan's style. So again, you see here how this is laid out in a proposal format. So once you've gone through those sections, your next section is going to be the manuscript itself. And this is where you're gonna talk about um, basically uh, three or four things. The first thing is status. Have you begun writing yet? If you have begun writing, how many words do you have? Um, if it's a research heavy book, have you completed that research or is there still research to, to do? If it's, if the book is based on, um, your interaction with others, if you're going to have to travel somewhere, um, you know, have you done that? Basically given a, a description of what it is that you have completed so far on the manuscript. The second thing that you want to call out is what are the special features? For example, if you're writing a book about the journeys of Paul, are you going to have a map or a, or a chart that demonstrates his, his um, travel through that region? And is that uh, illustrative or illuminating for the reader to have that as a part? Um, are you going to have an index? Are you going to have a glossary of terms? What are the, what are the other features in this book that you, that you envision having that will help you uh, really communicate your idea? You don't have to include these, by the way, but if you are going to have them, then you want to call those out. And then you want to talk about manuscript length. And it's really important that you not guess here. As a part of the proposal, and again, we'll get to this toward the end, you have to have a couple sample chapters, and you want to put your very best foot forward. So as you write those chapters, for all intents and purposes, by the time you've got them included in a proposal, they should be complete. And so how many words are those chapters? And then how many chapters are you proposing your book's going to have? And that's going to get you your, your manuscript length. Now, I hear a lot, and one of, the, one of the things that a lot of prospective authors tell me these days is, well, do people even really read books anymore? And can I just write a book that's about 20,000 words? Because, you know, I, I just want to get the audience engaged, and they should be able to read it on a plane ride. And, and there are instances where that might be true. But... Every study that's coming out right now is telling us that the younger generations from millennials on down are actually reading books in physical format more than the boomer generation. And so we had this steady decline from the boomers down through the millennials, but with the millennials, they've actually spiked ahead of the boomer generation are reading books and they're preferring physical books to electronic. So oftentimes I'm actually hearing that from Somebody my age is a Gen X who their generation maybe doesn't read books as much as they saw their parents read. But depending on who your audience is, it may be that um, they read at a greater clip than you think. The other issue here is just the very, the economics of publishing, which aren't impacted by electronic books as much as people think they are. The basic economics of publishing require that books be somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 70,000 words. Sometimes they're longer, sometimes they're shorter. Um, but Amazon, I mean, one of the ways that, in which Amazon started getting into uh, self-publishing was through a program they called Kindle Singles. And those were for, for works that were between five and 30,000 words. Now, a lot of people today would think 30,000 words is a full-length book, and in some instances it is. But for the, for the most part, that's really considered too short for a book. So as you think about your content and as you go through this process, manuscript length becomes really important because it, it will help you decide, do you have enough? Have you done enough research? Do you actually have enough 
ideas to share, or is this actually better as an article or a series of blog posts or a self-published smaller resource? Um, so again, I'm harping here on manuscript blank, but it's important that you think this through and that, um, that you really make sure you've got enough information to share to make a full length book because publishers will turn down projects that are even good ideas um, simply because they don't think they're long enough. I've, I've heard many times, you know, I think this is an article, not a book. And then finally, you're going to talk about the completion date. And this is how long do you need to finish your book? A very common way to describe this is I can have the manuscript completed within six months of a signed contract or nine months from the date of this proposal, et cetera. And you need to be really realistic about this. Any publisher that you work with is going to want to have your manuscript a minimum of nine months and, and most often 12 months from the date you turn it in to the date of publication. And there's a lot of reasons for that in terms of the how the industry works. Uh, it's largely driven by their need to sell books to retailers and the retailers that they communicate with are asking for them to be that far out. But the, the point of that is that because that window is so long, they're going to begin working on title with you. They're going to begin working on cover with you. They're going to begin working on marketing and sales information. The publisher is investing time and resources and energy in your book a year before it's published. And if you're not going to hit your manuscript deadline, then that throws a big wrench in everything. They either have to really shrink the amount of time they have to help market and publicize your book, or they have to shrink the amount of time they can help you edit your book, or they have to push a book out of the current calendar and into a different publishing season, which they really don't like to do because they've already communicated to the retailers what their, what their list is and, and what books they can expect from them as publisher. So again, it's really important that you be a good partner with your publisher on this and communicate an, an accurate date. Now, obviously things happen, sometimes things move, that's okay. But don't tell a publisher on the front end that you can get this book written in three, it's gonna take you 12. And then I'm just looking here for my sample proposal. And here you've got um, manuscript status on the veneer proposal. They've got words. They've got a timeline for when they think they can have it done. And then they've got the call out of the special features um, that they think that they're going to have in this project. And again, pretty straightforward, pretty simple, but trying to give you some of the background as to why this is such important information, even though it obviously takes up such little information on the page. So once you've gone through that, then we're into the market section. And what you're describing here is who is the audience member for your book? And I would strongly encourage you to spend as much time on this as you can and actually do it outside of the proposal. Sit down with a blank sheet of paper and think about in terms of what you want to write, who you're writing to. Uh, imagine that you're actually sitting across the table from somebody. Who is that person? And there's two ways to describe that person. You can talk about demographics and you can talk about psychographic. The demographics are going to be your external characteristics. How old are they? Are you speaking to men or are you speaking to women? Are you speaking to college educated and higher or are you speaking to somebody with a high school education? Are you What's their religious affiliation? Did they grow up Southern Baptist or are they mainline Protestant or are they atheist or are they Catholic? Um, you, you really want to think that through because even if you're writing Christian content, for example, there's a lot of denominational differences um, and they don't all use the same language the same way. So it matters what your, what your reader's religious affiliation is. The psychographic description is where you go a little bit deeper. Um, these aren't the, the external observable characteristics, but it's, it's the, the, 
the internal characteristics. What life stage are they in? What do they struggle with? What are their doubts? What are the things that they need or that they want? What are their regrets in life? Are you speaking to somebody in their 70s who maybe feels like they don't have a great relationship with their adult children? Or are you speaking to somebody in their 30s who have just started a family and feel like they, they never have enough time to do everything they need to do and maybe they've got some economic worries and, and they don't know. I mean, they're, they're dealing with the terrible twos and they can't even imagine what 14 is gonna be. There's, so you really wanna, as you, as you think about your content, you think about your, your reader, it's helpful to, to write all of this out. Who are they? Imagine them as a real person, um, give them a name. And, and write out that description, both the demographic and the psychographic, as completely as you can. And you want to keep that front and center as you write as a general rule anyway. But then when you come to the proposal, you know, it may be that you want to write about a number of different topics um, over the course of your career. But for this specific book, what is it out of that audience profile that is the most relevant to this book? And then you want to describe your audience member in that way. So that's demographic and psychographic. And the next thing that you want to walk through is um, what's called affinity groups. And this is just basically where you describe uh, where you can find these people. Uh, do they have podcasts that they listen to regularly? Are there specific magazines or uh, newspapers that they often like to read? Who are their favorite authors? What television shows are they going to be interested in? What, what are their favorite movies? Um, are there other ministry organizations out there that they are on an email newsletter of? I mean, obviously you're not going to know this for everybody, but again, you're helping to cast some vision for who this person is that you're trying to reach and, and where they live. And then you also there's two ways to think about this in terms of, of audience. You've got what's called an aspirational audience and you've got an actual audience. So if you're just starting out in reading in writing, um, you're largely going to be describing an aspirational audience. These are the people that you want to reach. These are the people that you hope come to your content. But if you've spent any time actually communicating content, if you are a speaker or if you've started a blog, if you write on a regular basis, Analytics are your friend. Who are the people that are actually coming to you? And the more access you have to that kind of information, the more you can actually start to describe your actual audience. Uh, Facebook and Twitter both will provide you everything from economic demographics to gender to geographic region, et cetera. So the more that you begin to write and interact with your audience, you want to be continually refining your audience um, with the actual people that are coming to read you. And now let's walk through what this looks like in an actual proposal. So this is Jonathan's proposal again. And you'll see under target reader profile, he's got the demographic, but then he goes more into the psychographic. They're theologically and politically centrist. A uh, large portion would be considered broadly evangelical, even if they would not describe that way, describe themselves that way. And again, that's an important distinction because the language that he wants to talk about in this book, he's coming at it from an evangelical point of view versus, say, a Catholic point of view. Target audience is concentrated in an urban and suburban context. Um, those in the target are regular church attenders and love the church, even though they might be bothered by some of what they feel are the church's failings. And then he describes some of the felt needs. And one of the things that he did here um, that I would encourage you to model is he's actually put it in quotes. I mean, he, he tried to climb inside the head of his potential audience and, and describe what their needs are in the way that they would say it. And so I lack language to adequately express my relationship with God. I'm frustrated with tired, simplistic, spiritual language I've been given. I want to encounter God in a fresh way. It's a very clever way to demonstrate the felt needs uh, for your audience uh, as if they're saying it themselves. Now here's the veneer proposal. And similarly, again, you'll see they're coming at it from a very different way, um, but they're describing their audience in 
specific detail. Um, they refer to their audience as an early adopter a crowd. Um, they talk about the demographic. They say the typical veneer reader will range in age from 18 to 35. They're college students, graduate students, lifelong learners and early adopters. Uh, they recycle. They drink charity water. They want to end the conflicts in Darfur. Um, again, as, a, as, you, as you read through this audience description, you'll start to get a picture in your head of exactly who they're talking about. And, and that's the idea here is you want to lay out the audience for this book in such a way that your publisher is going to know exactly who it is you're reaching. But it also communicates, more importantly, that you know who you're reaching. A lot of people will make a mistake of saying, you know, I think there's something in this book for everybody. And oftentimes, if you try to write to everybody, you'll reach nobody. And so it's very important that you really narrow this down and be as specific as possible. And once you've gone through that, you're going to move to the competition section. And this is another one of the sections that I see overlooked time and time again. One of the most common statements I see in a proposal is there is no other book on the market like this. And I just have to encourage you, I can't encourage you enough, don't say that. Um, you are writing on a specific topic and the odds are someone else has to. And so what you want to be able to communicate here is not just that there is a market for your book, but that you know what the market for your book is. If you're writing on Grace, have you read Grace Awakened by Charles Swindoll? Have you read What's So Amazing About Grace? I mean, do you, do you even know what else is out there so that you know you're making a unique contribution? This, this is the section where you demonstrate that. So not only are you communicating to an agent or a publisher, that you know the market you're writing to and that you know what other books in that market exist, but then it's where you also describe how your book is different. What is the unique um, contribution that you're making on this topic? Now, there's another reason that this is such an important section that most people don't know, so insider tip. Um, these titles are actually what your publisher, if they decide they want to publish with you, are going to use to make you an offer. So when you get a publishing agreement, your, your publisher is going to typically offer what's called an advance. It's some sum of money that they're going to give you in exchange for having the publication rights to your book. That advance is often, well, that advance is determined by your publisher's best guess as to what the total sales of your book is going to be in the first year. One of the ways in which they determine that is, well, what have the other books in the market on this topic done? Now, if you think about real estate, an appraiser comes to your house and they decide what comparable sales in your neighborhood happened and they determine your, your value of your house based on that. And you don't really have a lot of say in that, but this is where you do have a say. You, you can communicate, these are the books that I actually want you to consider comparable to my title. And it will inform the publisher in how they evaluate your book and its potential performance in the market. So do not overlook this section. It's hugely important. So, Chris, when you show this section, is there any way you can zoom in a little bit more than, um, or, or is that kind of fixed with the size of the document that you've got? Um, I think I can zoom. Let's try. I'm sure we won't be able to see all of a page that way, but um, people might yeah. be able to read it a little bit better. So I'll just show you one, and here I'll zoom in. <laughs> well, I like those books. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So this is Jonathan. These are Jonathan's comp titles, and he's trying to communicate a few things here. Um, one, these are kind of classics on the vocabulary of faith. This is one by Kathleen Norris. Uh, is that helping? Yeah, that's great. We can definitely see, see it really well. Uh, this is a Frederick Buechner book, and this is a Frederick Buechner book as well. So he's communicating one thing. One, like he's read the classics. He knows what some of the best thinkers on this have had to say about it. But he's also subtly communicating through the use of these books that it's been a little while, that it's actually maybe time for an update or a refresher on how we think about our vocabulary. And then let me zoom out a little bit here. 
Um, sometimes as you go through these comp titles, you might take the titles one by one where you give a little description of the book and then you would talk about how yours is going to be a little different than that book. And you might do that for three or four titles here. He's kind of taking them collectively and he explains in a sentence what it is that they do. And then he says, learning to speak God from scratch is sufficiently unique from these titles and that it intermingles cultural commentary draws from a 21st century perspective, appeals to a broader audience, and taps into Jonathan's personal narrative, suggesting different ways of understanding the word's meanings, and explores many words not addressed by the Norris or Buechner books. So what he's doing here is demonstrating that he understands the market. He's demonstrating that it's probably been a little while since somebody has actually gone after what he's going after here, and then he's providing what his unique contribution will be, and that's how you want to approach that section. And then from there, you're gonna move into author biography. Now, what's important here is you wanna think about your biography as what it is that makes you qualified to write this book. And you will probably have an author biography that is, that is different for every project that you write. You've, depending on how old you are, you've had a lot of life's experiences, you've, you've had different educational experiences, et cetera. But there's two questions you're, you're ultimately answering for a publisher when you go through a proposal. First is, does this book need to exist? And that's the point of everything we've talked about to date, including the comp analysis. Then the second question is, are you the right author to write this book? It may be that you've lap tapped into something that absolutely should exist in the marketplace, but you may not be the right person to write that book because you don't have any personal experience. Uh, you wanna write a parenting book, but all of your kids are under the age of three. You're, you're just not gonna have a lot to offer anybody yet. You might have some great theories, but until you've lived them out, um, you're not gonna be seen as somebody with credible experience that you can then impart to the reader. So the point here with author biography is, ultimately, are you the right person to write it? And you wanna come at your biography in that way. You're gonna provide some background information you're going to provide some previous writing. Um, do you speak? Uh, and if so, where? And then there's a personal marketing section where you want to show all of your contacts of influence. You want to talk about your previous speaking and writing. You want to talk about specific things that you can do to help market your book. Um, sometimes I see uh, stated, you know, I'm, I'm willing to do anything the publisher wants me to do. Well, that's, that's just not helpful. In today's world, unfortunately, the publishers rely on the authors to, to bring a built-in audience to the table. We're not gonna talk a lot about platform today, but this is where you get to demonstrate a little bit about what your platform is and what you bring to the table to help sell your books. And so you wanna talk about these in realities. This is not a place to be um, aspirational, um, but you, you wanna talk about what you actually have access to and what you can do from a personal marketing standpoint. Um, so let me show this here with Jonathan's. So you'll see um, he focuses on what he does. He's a columnist. Uh, he shares a little bit about what some of his media appearances has been. He talks about his, his actual online readership. And one of the things with Jonathan is he, he writes on a regular basis about faith and culture. And so his book, what he's demonstrating through his platform descriptions here are why that experience as a faith and culture writer actually qualify him to write on this kind of topic. Um, and then some of this, when he talks about increasing online readership and expanding social media presence, he's just trying to demonstrate what his growing platform is and his newly launched email newsletter, his speaking schedule, his, his work as a writing coach. These are all things meant to demonstrate his ability to, um, to help sell this book. Now, this is something that you may or may not have access to, depending on how long you've been growing your platform. One of the things that you can do to demonstrate, even if it's smaller, that you're moving in the right direction is what's the growth? And as, as Jonathan was able to chart his growth in social media and online readership, you'll see here that there's a fairly dramatic rise in the arc up to the right um, as, of, as of late. 
And so what you're communicating to a publisher here is, hey, by the time this book comes out 12 to 18 months later, if this trend continues, I'm gonna be in a pretty good spot. And so this is a, this is a unique way that you can demonstrate that even though you might have a smaller but growing audience, that it is headed in the right direction. And then this is his personal marketing section. And he talks about being able to leverage his network for a speaking tour, that he'll be able to leverage his network for a blog tour. Um, he's a writer for Religion News Service, and he has the ability with, through his position there to do a press release through them. And so again, just very tangible things that he's bringing to the table that he's able to offer a publisher to help market this book. And then from there, um, you're gonna get into a chapter by chapter synopsis. And this is where you're basically laying out your table of contents. This is, you're taking the reader from point A to point B and you're getting them there through these steps. And so, um, you know, imagine just opening up any book with a table of contents. It's basically what you have here except you're also providing about a two to three sentence description of each chapter. You don't want this to be overly long. You don't want multiple paragraphs, um, but if two or three sentences aren't enough, if you need you know, a paragraph and a half, that's okay too. The thing to capture here is what is the, what is the, the big idea in this chapter? How does this chapter help read the move, the move the reader through the arc that you want to take them on? what you're now demonstrating to a publisher or to an agent is that you have a very definite understanding of what it is you're trying to accomplish, um, that it makes sense, and uh, that you've thought this through. So this table of, con the, the chapter by chapter synopsis, when I get done reading that chapter by chapter synopsis, I should be able to tell you back what your book is about, what the major things are you're gonna communicate, and what it is that the reader's takeaways are gonna be. It's your, it's your narrative arc. And then finally after that, you're gonna have sample chapters. And these are where you're putting your best writing foot forward. I always encourage people, you wanna do an introduction and two chapters. It's okay if you only have two chapters. You don't need more than an introduction and two chapters. The less is more in this instance. Uh, a lot of folks, I mean, I had, I've had proposals where people send me the entire manuscript and what, they, and what they have articulated as the reason they want to do that is because a proposal just doesn't give them enough space to communicate everything they have to say. Well, the problem is, again, when your publisher decides they want to sell this book, they're going to splice it up in a hundred different ways. They're going to, they're going to create a two paragraph description that goes on the back of the book. They're going to create a couple paragraphs for sales description in a sales catalog. The salesperson who goes and calls at your retailer is gonna have you know 10 seconds. So all of that information we've been working through on this proposal from a one sentence hook to a two sentence premise to the shorter descriptions, these are all your opportunity to speak into how the publisher sees this and will oftentimes inform some of those short snippets that they ultimately create to help market and sell um, your project in the retail space. So that is what you're needing to communicate. Then with the sample chapters, you're saying, okay, yeah, I can actually write. And they don't need more than a couple chapters to see that you can, can articulate from start to finish the big idea you laid out in the chapter by chapter synopsis for that chapter and see where you're taking it. And if you've done a good job on the bulk of the proposal, really communicating clearly that you understand who your audience is, what it is you want to tell them, that you have something important to offer them, and then you lay out in a couple sample chapters your ability to communicate that in an effective and compelling way, you will be uh, miles ahead of most first-time authors or prospective authors that I see. Um, now, in terms of showing you what this looks like, let's just pull back up the proposal really quickly. Now, for design purposes, he's, he's obviously kind of mixed up how this all looks. Um, so I'm gonna pull out a little bit. You may not be able to read the actual text, but that's okay. What you wanna see here is chapter zero is basically his introduction. And, he's, and he says, struck mute in a strange land is the title of that introduction. And he, and he tells his story of moving to New York and realizing the language he has is ineffective. 
And then he goes through the rest of this and each chapter is a word that he wants to explore. So he's going to have this book, obviously, is going to have shorter chapters, but there's going to be more chapters because he's not going to be able to spend tons and tons of time with every word, but he wants to cover a number. So you see here some of the words, all, orthodoxy, commands, rhythm, heaven, hell, doubt, belief, disillusion, truth, love. And he's providing that one to two sentence description under each that is the big takeaway. And he's even gone through the process of bolding in each section what is the big idea in each chapter description. So you can just see that in these sections where he's calling out for the publisher through his design, like, hey, this is the big idea. Um, and he goes that way all the way through. And then leads into, um, he's got some of the bonus features down here at the end instead of up in the uh, manuscript status description. But at any event, that's basically the guts of a proposal. Now, a couple of things I would say, one, design certainly isn't necessary, um, but it's helpful. And if you have the ability to do that, great. If you don't, um, there's a lot of places you can get it done for relatively cheaply. Uh, you can go to upwork.com and there are tons of people out there with design experience. You can, you can ask for the process and you can even put up there what you say you are willing to pay and uh, folks will bid for the opportunity to help you design your proposal. It doesn't have to be expensive. We get proposals designed all the time for as little as $100. Some folks spend as much as $700, but it doesn't have to be an expensive process. Um, so I don't want you to feel overwhelmed seeing that, thinking that you could never do that. It's, it's really not that complicated. But at the same time, if you can't go through that process, that's okay. Ultimately, the content is the, is the key here. And no amount of design is going to help you sell a project that you haven't thought through well in the proposal stage or where you haven't clearly and compellingly communicated your idea. So <clears throat> with that, um, Brian, I'll turn it back over to you and we can take some questions. Sure, sure. Chris, that was just an excellent presentation. Thank you so much for all of that practical um, advice and, and you know what I feel is extremely useful information for people and I think those examples and kind of the differences between the two examples you know are really great for people to be able to see. So as Chris mentioned let's go ahead and open it up for questions. You can type in your question in the chat box and uh, we'll get to um, as many of those as we can. Um, let me go ahead and start off with one. Um, so Chris uh, we didn't talk too much about platform um, today, but you know one of the things that's an issue for folks um, is you know growing their social media numbers. You want to talk a little bit about what kinds of followers matter or what kinds of followers don't matter from a social media perspective? Sure, um, and I think the the way to answer that is actually a question of engagement. So. There is no magic number of Twitter followers or Facebook fans or blog readers um, that are going to turn a publisher's head. Obviously, if you've just started and you have a couple hundred, um, you've got a long way to go, but you don't need to have a couple hundred thousand. Um, you may have, you know, 8,000 Twitter followers, but every time you post a piece of content, that is shared, uh, retweeted, quoted, liked, etc., in an astronomical amount of time. The what the publishers are ultimately looking for is what is your engagement of your audience? How interested are they? When you put up a blog post, are you getting a lot of comments and are you getting a lot of shares? When you post something on Facebook, are you getting a lot of likes and shares? Um, the problem in social media is that somebody can follow you or like you and never actually see another thing you say. Um, I, I use lists in my Twitter feed and so I follow people and, and I never actually see anything that they post. So, uh, and that's true for a lot of people. And then in Facebook worlds, you have them constantly changing algorithms and wanting to encourage people to pay to promote their posts and so anything you put there isn't necessarily going to be seen by everybody who follows you and may even want to see what you have to say. 
So I would encourage you that as you grow your platform, focus on engagement and focus on how often these folks are, are really uh, interacting with your content. And as you can demonstrate an increasing amount of engagement as a percentage of your followership, that will be really meaningful. So Chris, a couple of people have asked about, is it possible to receive a sample proposal um, by email so they can refer to it in the future? Um, I can imagine that you don't want to share the specific things that you shared here because that's obviously private information for Jonathan and for the other author. But is there something that's a little bit more genericized that um, we could offer to our attendees? Sure. In fact, I'd be happy to pull together, Brian, a couple of links to places where um, you can see sample proposals, uh, if that would be helpful. I can tell you if uh, if you go to michaelhyatt.com, uh, it's, it's unfortunately an article that you've got to buy, but he has an article that walks through this in pretty specific detail, not, not all that dissimilar from what I just shared, and, and in there, he actually has a sample proposal that he's walking you through. Um, the great thing about this information is it's pretty universal. Um, all of the information we walk through is what just about anybody would tell you you need if you if you go and search for uh, sample proposals. Um, there are a lot available online, but Brian, if it'd be helpful, we could pull together some specific links that you could send to your um, webinar subscribers. Absolutely, no, that'd be perfect. I'll be glad to forward those on. Um, given uh, one of the questions from Jennifer, given the need solution premise that you've described, is there a different mode of proposal for a memoir, or would that be similar? Memoir would be similar um, to this layout. Um, <laughs> depending on how you want to write that memoir. So there's there's memoir that is strictly storytelling, and it really is more akin to fiction, and, and there are pretty significant dis distinctions for a fiction proposal from nonfiction for a lot of reasons. I mean, the fact that it's story-based, it typically you don't have chapter titles, uh, all of that. So there is a different way to go about um, preparing a fiction proposal. And if, and if your memoir is straight storytelling, more akin to fiction, then this wouldn't apply. If, if your memoir is more prescriptive, meaning you're using your story or life's experience to try to help teach or communicate to um, your reader something you've learned. Uh, we recently worked on a memoir called Beautiful Still, uh, where September, the author, talks about the loss of her child. And it's a prescriptive memoir, and she walked through this exact same process. I mean, we prepared a proposal just like this to, again, demonstrate to a publisher that that she's got something to share, that she's actually done the work over years of processing what the impact of that loss was on her faith and on her spiritual life and and wanted to come alongside the reader who might be facing similar loss or, or a different loss that's um, you know, equally important for them to know how to process and, and really walk them through that process. So she's sharing her story in that book, but the format of the proposal and the format that that book ultimately take was very similar um, to what we walked through here today. Very helpful. Um, you know, what Jonathan was writing there in some sense is like a memoir in that it's describing his own personal experience and a process that he had to go through himself. But obviously, the format of, of what the book is is atypical for a memoir. But you know, I think it's a great example of how he has recast very personal experience that has a lot of meaning for him and a lot of learning for him into a completely different format that you know is non traditional for for a memoir. That's right. Very very smart, I think, thing to do. So um, as you all know, Chris is a literary agent. So I think one good question is, what advice would you give for an author looking to find an agent? Yeah, so um, the, the thing to remember about agents is, for the most part, they all work in very specific fields. Um, if you want to find a real estate agent, most real estate agents would be willing to represent your house, uh, but 
you probably want to find somebody in your area who knows your neighborhood, who's maybe sold some houses around you, et cetera. I mean, the more they're honed in with, with where you live and understand your market, the better they're going to be able to serve you. And I mean, that's just more true here when you're trying to find a literary agent. So for example, I don't represent children's books. I don't represent poetry. I really don't represent fiction. So trying to get a proposal to my agency just is not going to go anywhere. So you want to research the agents that you approach. There are writer's guides that you can search um, online for that will have descriptions of just about every agency and publisher out there. Um, and so that's a place to start. One of my favorite ways to tell authors to go find an agent is if you go to you know, your public library, or you go to a bookstore, find the books that are similar to what you want to write or find the authors that are similar to you and go look in the acknowledgements. Um, in almost every case, the author is thanking uh, their agent in the acknowledgements and you might start to see some recurring names of people that are representing the authors in the books that are similar to what you want to do. And then again, if you want to invest a little bit, there's a website called publishersmarketplace.com and it's a subscription based site, but they have a contact, basically a database of agents and publishers. And they also catalog actual um, sales that have taken place in the industry and you can search by specific topics. So if you're writing on religion, you can search for deals in the last 36 months um, that have been accomplished in the market and it will tell you who the agent was. It will tell you who the, the acquiring publisher was. It will give a description of the book and you can start to ferret out in that way. Uh, again, who's representing books similar to yours. Uh, but it is important that you do that research. And then when you approach them, approach them personally. Uh, and again, you want to have done some research on the agent and who they represent and the books that they publish and have a paragraph in your query letter that describes why you approach them. Um, when we get submissions that are addressed to dear agent or <laughs> every agent is in the two line that they've submitted to, I mean, just to be honest, that's a automatic disqualifier for us. Um, we want to we want to work with folks that have taken this seriously and have, and have done the, the work of researching, you know, who we are and what we represent and why they think they're a good fit for us. That just goes a long way to getting your foot in the door um, with agents. So um, in our webinar last evening with Lil Copan, um, she talked about how many of the large publishing houses don't even look at books, generally speaking, that don't come through an agent. And probably in some of the smaller houses, that's not quite so much the case. However, it seems as though the odds of getting your book published um, are significantly lower when you're not represented by agent. And I know you're agent, so you're not completely unbiased in this question, but do you have, but I trust your judgment anyway, Chris. So I, um, do you have a sense of what that looks like for you know some of the relevant publishers? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it is true that most of the major publishers, be they general market or Christian publishers, um, if you go to their website and you look for where you can submit your project for consideration, they will have a line that says, we do not accept unsolicited manuscripts, or we don't, select, we don't accept unagented manuscripts. Um, the reality in the industry, and, and this is frankly increased with the rise of self-publishing, is that lots and lots of people want to write books. And so the publishers actually rely on their network of agents to be the filter of potential projects out there. They, they just don't have the wherewithal or means to independently decide what they want to work on in terms of what comes through submissions. And so the agents are their first line of defense. We, we are, in a sense, an unpaid acquisitions team for those publishers. And oftentimes, you know, editors and agents form a closer relationship. They have a level of trust. And, and um, I mean, I, I've had in the past editors who, you know, acquire significantly more from me than other editors do just because we've got a good working relationship. And so, you know, part of that agency process is, is you want to, if you have options with agents, you want to learn who they work with. And, who do they tend to um, 
you know, sell their projects to or the publishers they work the most with. But the answer to your question is that is absolutely true. It, it is next to impossible to get a publishing relationship without an agent. They do oftentimes, um, I mean, if you have a direct relationship, they will often work with you. But I have found, at least in the general market, there's a lot of things that an agent does for you that the publisher doesn't want to have to do. And so even if you had a direct relationship and, and an editor at a publishing house decided they wanted to acquire your project, it would not be uncommon for them to then connect you with an agent they like and trust to represent you as their agent because they don't want to have to do the, 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 they don't want to have to handle the in between on a number of different areas, such as negotiating a publishing agreement that they know the agent will do. Um, whereas you as an author might have a lot of first time questions. They're just, they just don't want to field. So maybe one thing that would be helpful for, you know, a lot of the folks probably are not familiar with the, what the business model looks like for an agent. You know, how did, how does your firm make money in representing an author? Sure. So an agency is paid on a commission off of what you get paid. So let's say you, you, the author. You, the author, yeah. So let's say that you, that you secure a publishing deal from XYZ Publisher, and they offer you a $10,000 advance, and that's an advance against the royalties that your book is gonna earn based on its sales. Um, the, your agent would earn a commission on that advance. The predominant agency commission is 15%. There are some agencies out there that are now charging 20%. Um, but the agent will not get paid unless you do. Uh, so if you earn $10,000, then the agent would at a 15% commission, they would get 1500 and you would get 8,500. And they, again, they would, that amount is typically split into three or four payments um, from the publisher, uh, one payment on signing, one payment on when you actually deliver the manuscript, one payment when you publish the manuscript um, and your agent gets paid when you do. If, if you have, if you approach an agency who wants you to pay them to simply review or read your proposal, you're not likely dealing with a reputable agency. Are there the majority of agents still looking for new authors or are many of the agents basically already booked and not accepting submissions from new authors? Yeah, that's a great question. I, in my experience, um, we're all looking for for new authors. The, the thing that has happened in the publishing industry um, as things have gotten more competitive and you know, sales have gotten harder to come by, publishers are, are looking oftentimes for what they consider to be a sure thing. So you know, any best-selling established author is going to be easy to sell. Um, but they're also looking for new authors with great ideas and big platforms. Um, the hardest person to get a publishing deal in, in the industry right now is somebody with three or four or five books under their belt with moderate success. I mean, it used to be that the industry was almost built on that. They had their, their, their mid-list authors. They just knew we're going to turn out a book every month, you know, every 12 to 18 months, and it was going to earn X amount of dollars. And, and that kind of kept the lights on. And then the big winners were nice and the surprise breakouts were nice. But today, um, you have almost a better shot with a new author with a great idea and a good platform um, than you do with somebody with a, a mild, you know, a, a moderate to less than successful track record. So there's a lot of opportunity for new authors, but you do have to be able to demonstrate that you have an audience you're bringing to the table. And that's, again, that's the platform question. So given what you just said, um, you know, one avenue, a potential avenue for uh, a new author that does not have much of a platform, doesn't have any books published, one avenue that they could potentially take is to self-publish their first book or maybe first couple of books. And then, you know, with the hopes that the success that would be generated there and the proven writing and ability that would be generated there would entice a publisher on the third book. Is that a wise path to take or is it just like all or nothing on the first shot you got to get an agent or a publisher or forget it yeah it's a fair question I uh, some agents are pretty anti self-publishing I'm I'm not I even for established authors I think there's great opportunities for self-publishing but what I tell authors is that self-publishing is not a shortcut to getting published 
if your ultimate goal is to be a successful commercially published author, self-publishing is not going to be that shortcut because the, the pub, what the publisher can ultimately do for you is amplify your built-in audience. When you self-publish, you only have access to your built-in audience. There's no amplification happening whatsoever. So if you self-publish a book, but you've not done any work to develop an audience or build a following, you're only going to sell a few copies. And what you're actually demonstrating at that point to a publisher is you, you've now gone from having an opportunity to convince a publisher that you have a growing audience. You now have a tangible example of what the size of that audience is and your ability to sell to that audience. So self-publishing will never be a shortcut or a, um, a sort of a backdoor into publishing because it it's only going to either expose the strength of your audience which is fantastic and in that case it might um, help you get published or it's going to expose the weakness of your audience in which case it's going to it's going to be one more thing against you as you're trying to find a commercial publisher well that makes a whole lot of sense good news and bad news right <laughs> that's right so can you talk a little bit about timeline um, in terms of what's typical from, let's say, when you first engage with an author to when they might expect, and I know these are, I'm asking you for kind of generic answers for things sure. that vary, but, you know, from the time that you first engage with an author who's got a decent idea, it's got, it's got enough material and in order to to convince you at least, you know, that you want to um, try to represent them and get a book deal done. So if the time from when you first have that conversation and you're convinced to when they should accept that a book deal would be done and then maybe the time from there to when that book would be published. Sure. So I have found in my experience working with authors who are motivated to get going um, even if they come to me with a completed first draft proposal, it, we typically spend a month to two months honing that proposal. Now it doesn't always have to take that long and there are obviously times it takes longer, but on average, it's usually takes about a month to two months to really get that proposal into tip top shape. From that point, you submit to your list of publishers that you want to submit to, um, and they go through a multi internal meeting process to make determinations on potential projects. So those meetings happen typically once every other week or in some cases once a month. So the process for that project to go through their internal uh, acquisitions process just is always going to take six to eight weeks. There's no way around that. Um, Again, sometimes it can move faster, oftentimes it moves slower, but six to eight weeks on average. Once you've gone through that process, it might take another week to two if you fielded a few offers and you're negotiating with a publisher. Um, you know, but at that point, you're up to four months. Uh, and if the point at which you accept an offer, I always encourage my, my authors, start writing. Like you've accepted an offer, everybody's moving forward in good faith, you wanna keep writing. And the reason for that is that the actual contract might then take another four to six weeks to actually get a draft. And that can go through multiple weeks of negotiation. So from start to finish, you should be expecting a six to seven month process from the, from the moment you submit a proposal to an agent who's willing to represent you to the moment you might actually have a signed contract and an initial payment in hand. And then another quite a few months or and a year? Nine, about nine to 12 months, uh, typically 12. Um, before that book is actually published. That, that makes a lot of sense. So um, one la last question, Chris, before we let you go. Um, <clears throat> I think a number of the folks, based on the questions, were kind of blown away by the presentation that, um, or excuse me, the proposal that you showed of Jonathan Merritt's. And obviously, you showed us that because it's really good. <laughs> it displays a lot of very positive uh, aspects of a, of a great book proposal. And you know, Jonathan has quite a platform, you know, that he's built up yeah. over quite a few years in terms of his audience, in terms of his different um, outlets to reach his audience. Um, and I know you talked about how we shouldn't get um, enamored with the splash, you know, with the design aspect of it. That's something that um, can be hired pretty, pretty inexpensively if a person doesn't want to do it themselves. Right. But um, can you speak a little bit about, you know, 
an aspect of a proposal for someone who doesn't have quite the uh, the strength that a Jonathan has in, in going into it. You're talking specifically with like reach and platform. Well, certainly that's one of the things I think that you know is difficult for uh, a new author to um, to build. You know, yeah. if they don't have something like that already. Um, otherwise, you know, I think at least from my own perspective, uh, you know, it's all about the idea and presenting the idea in the way that you described with all of the proof points behind it and who the audience is and, and all of that. But, uh, but I think it's a little bit, um, what do I say? Um, daunting. Yes. For, <laughs> for people. Sure. And, um, I mean, for the sake of, of time, I stopped switching back and forth between the veneer proposal and the, the merit proposal. But, you know, again, part of the reason I wanted to have the veneer proposal is it's it's basically just a word does a, a word document. Um, it's not highly designed. Um, they also didn't have anywhere near the level of reach or media exposure that Jonathan had. Um, so I, I mean, I would tell you again. You, you need to be honest with what you have, and that's okay. Um, there are still times when a really great idea from the right author uh, will sell and sell well, even if even if they don't have that significant platform. Um, but the you know the market or the author section that we walked through, where you're also talking about your personal connections and personal marketing, you've got to put there what you have. Um, I will tell you when Jonathan entered this industry 10 years ago, he'd never written a thing professionally. I mean, he reached out to an author uh, and basically asked them to be his mentor. And then he did everything that author said to do over the course of about three years before he ever got his first article published. And so he's, you know, I, I love to use Jonathan as an example because he started at zero and he's got to the point where he is today through a lot of hard work and connections. And, you know, again, he's, he's my poster child for there is no shortcut. Um, but in terms of the proposal, I mean, wherever you're at, the, these are the sections that you have to have. And so you may not have as impressive social media reach or, or news clips, and that's, that's fine. Um, you don't have to. I mean, everybody is at different levels. Um, but you do need to be able to put in there what you do have. And again, it doesn't have to be splashy. It doesn't have to be well designed. The, the most important thing is the content. And if you, you know, unfortunately, again, we don't have time to simply read through the proposal, but the content's good. Um, so Jonathan, Jonathan has a, an aesthetic that he likes, and we brought that into the proposal. But but the, we we worked on the content. This was this was pulled together through email messages and word documents before it ever ever started to look the way that it does now. <coughs> I think that's really important context for you to um, to share, Chris, about Jonathan's background. You know, it, it's all about patience and perseverance and hard work, and it takes time to to build all of that. So um, I think that that's really an important point. Um, also, for those who might not be aware, Jonathan, who we've been talking about throughout this uh, webinar, is going to be one of our presenters. Uh, Tuesday night next week, he is going to talk about how to build a platform, and he's going to talk about how he's done that through blogging. So um, you can hear that part of the story um, on Tuesday night, and I'm sure if you want to ask uh, him other questions about uh, his book proposal, I'm sure he'd be glad to answer that too. Yeah, he's a wealth of information. I'd highly encourage you checking him out. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Chris, this has been a truly outstanding presentation. I thank you so much for bringing all this wealth of insight, experience, knowledge, and sharing it very clearly, articulately, and I think valuably for our audience. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank and you, uh, thank you for all of our attendees. Thank you for our listeners.